Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank thee because that thou hast permitted us to live in this day to see these great signs and wonders happening by your hand. And there's no one here any more uh, conscious that it is that your servant who knows these things than I am. It is you, Lord, and by your promise, you promised you would do these things, and thou always keep your promise. And to this we are thankful and give thee praise. Bless us this afternoon in the Word, tonight in the great evening service. We'll praise thee in Christ's name. Amen. You be seated. I was just trying to think a few moments ago, if you'll step that just as high as you can, I... Anybody ever had the flu? <laughs> this is petting my little boy, Joseph. I think I must have caught his bad cold. And uh, he's got a very bad throat. I've got a preacher's throat. I haven't known the time in 25 years that my throat wasn't constantly red. Because I preach, pray for the sick, day and night, Day in and out, week in and out, month, year in and out, see. And it just keeps me constantly talking. And uh, so uh, I get a little, little, did it ever get sore? I don't believe I ever did have a sore throat. Never did have a throat sore. It's just overtaxed, and then it gets cold in there, of course, and it swells up the line. And then it being raw, it gives the germ a chance to get in. I was something here. Oh, yes, I was reading a letter. I wish I had brought that. I knew I should do something. Rosella, is she here this afternoon? Rosella Griffin? Yeah. Silly wants to see you and make that arrangement for you. I was reading your letter just a while ago. And um, so they, uh, this lady came in here somewhere in this, uh, this uh, auditorium right here, this church. And the Holy Spirit told her, said, lady, you got cancer. And she had come in here from somewhere in the West. And she said, when I walked off the platform, I said, she said to her husband, now that just can't be. So now, I didn't say anything when Brother Brandon said that. So, but I, I just thought, now wait a minute. I know, and then said, I told her, said, who she was, where she come from, what had been her symptoms and everything. And said so the doctor couldn't find her trouble, but said, you had cancer. And she doubted that. And now I've got the letters. I'll bring them tonight. That'll be a good time tonight. And now she's in the hospital just at the point of death with cancer. See, it was there. The doctor couldn't find it, but the Holy Spirit knew it was there. Now, now I don't say this, you see, but perhaps if she hadn't have doubted that, the story might have been different to her. If she hadn't doubted it, you must believe. Now, to me, you don't have to believe me. I'm just a man. But when he says that it ain't, it's the truth. It's the truth. And so one time in a meeting, it was in Canada, way up here in... Uh, uh, I can never think of that city. Across from Detroit. Windsor. Windsor, Ontario. And there was um, a man slipped into the meeting, and he thought it was a telepathy. And he put on his prayer card on the back of it, I have so many diseases and things like that, there wasn't nothing wrong with him. And when he came up to the platform, he had to be in the part of the line, I was just going through praying for the sick. And he said, could you tell me what's wrong with me? And Brother Baxter started passing him on. I said, just a moment. He said, no, I don't know what's wrong with me. Brother Baxter said, we're not having that. Now, he'd been better off than listening to Brother Baxter. And went on through. <clears throat> but no, he had to stop. And when he did, then the Holy Spirit said to him, there's nothing wrong with you. You have no disease at all. He said, oh, yes, I do. He said, look on my card down there that they got. I said, I don't care what you got on your card. You, you haven't got nothing wrong with you. And he said, oh, yes. I said, well, you, he said, I've got it. But I got, I got stated on my card. I said, I don't know about your card. I never see that. You just get a card. You 
Anything you want to put on it, you put on it. But if I ever see that, the ministers get them. And he said, uh, but he said, I said, you might have had it, and maybe you had uh, a faith in material. Oh, he said, that's what it is, is it? Turned around. Just then I looked, and there was a vision. I said, why is the devil putting your heart to do that? I said, you are, now if this is a person of that in this building, I'm not speaking this to a church. I said, you're a Church of Christ minister. They love the fuss. I said, you're a Church of Christ preacher. Last night, you sat with a man with a gray suit and a red tie. And you sat at a table, had a little green cloth hanging over it. There's a blonde-headed woman sat next to you, and you sat with telepathy. And you come to this meeting today and wrote that on there, thinking you could pass it through and make a telepathy out of it to tri- uptrip God's spirit. I said, you're the one exposed. And just then the man sat up there and said, Mr. Brandon, I'm the guy who's with him. So that's my wife sitting right here was with him. And I said, the things that you put on your cards, you have. Both cancer and TV. He fell down on the platform, but the last time I heard of him, I never heard no more, just a letter from some of the people that is in a serious condition. So we're not playing in church. The infallibility of the Holy Spirit. Not the infallibility of the man. The man has no infallibility. But the Holy Spirit is absolutely infallible. Don't pretend nothing. You be what you are. When you say, I'll now accept Christ as my healer, you mean that. Don't you just slip around the corner and say, well, I'll try Brother Roberts when he comes in or somebody else. You never do that. That's a dangerous thing. Very dangerous. And you, you be just what you are. If you're not a Christian, don't say you are. If you're a sinner, admit it. God knows it. And now your your sinful condition, just because you belong to church, that won't help you one bit. You might have a confession in your name on the book and live in a righteous life. And you're still a sinner. You've got to be born again. Not with a mental mind, but by something that's happened in your heart. It's got to be, friends. Don't never let the devil blindfold you to that. It doesn't come by intellectual conception. It comes by birth. And your life hopes right with that. You must have it. I wish to read. And just take about 20 or 30 minutes of your time. I'm poor. But I want an evangelistic service the Lord given us tonight to pray for the sick. Now, I've chosen for this afternoon for a subject found over in Psalm 63 and the first three verses. O God, Thou art my God, early will I seek Thee. My soul thirst for Thee, my, my flesh longeth for Thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. To see Thy power and Thy glory, so as I have seen Thee in Thy sanctuary, because thy love kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise thee. We have the most unusual text this afternoon. The reading of God's holy word. When I read this, it just turned me around. And I thought to say within myself, what was the prophet speaking of? When he said, Thy love kindness is better to me than life. There's nothing no better than life. And then, Thy love kindness is better than life. My lips shall praise thee. Well, I thought there must be different kinds of life. Now many people begin to think on the subject of life. And now, feeling free, and I have always tried to not hold things back. Never in my life, knowingly, have I ever called out a character's name or some individual's name. I have rebuked sin, preached what I thought was right, but never disregarded any brother. Right. He could be just as wrong, and I could be wrong too. But regard him being wrong, don't disfellowship him from my 
for my fellowship with Christ with him. We are brothers. But I heard a minister last night, it happened to be in our room, there was a television, and I'm not much on television, as you know. If it's the right thing, all right. But there's so little right on it, I just don't have one in my house. And so, uh, it was a famous evangelist that was preaching last night that said, when a man is born, he receives a life. And that life he will be forever. Uh, a man of that caliber. But I just wondered if you'd ever sit down to think this. The Bible said, The soul that sinneth it shall die. Right. Yes, sir. Everything that has a beginning has an end. And if things that had no beginning, it has no end. And there's only one eternal life. That's in God. That's right. All other life has an end. That's right. But God has no end because he had no beginning. And we being parts of God have eternal life with God. But everything that has any other type of life had a beginning, it has an end. All the eternal things last. Now the word forever comes in a conjunction, forever and forever. Forever is a space of time. But eternity is no begin or end. It's just a perfect circle. There's no end in it at all. It's eternity. Forever, lots, you see, forever and conjunction forever. Two spaces of time. But eternity and eternal life means the same thing. See, it's in the same category. That it had no begin, neither does it have an end. It's forever the same. Ever was and ever will be the same. Now, in Brother Joseph's church where I feel just as free as I was at my tabernacle, and to give a little basis here before I bring my message to you from the Lord, I want to just do a little Bible teaching for a moment. There is a spirit in the world that is real, pure, unadulterated love. Right. And that love comes from the great spirit. It's God. Right. There is a spirit in the world, just pure, unadulterated righteousness. That spirit comes from God. Yeah. And all of the spirit of Righteousness, of love, of purity, that is God. That is the eternal, everlasting, without beginning or ending. That's God. The Logos, or it went out of God, as no disregards to Catholic people now, but the Catholic Church, I, my background, my family's Catholic. And I have the the Catholic people use the book called Facts of Our Faith. And they use the word of eternal sonship of God. The word don't even make sense to me. The word e eternal means eternity, which had no beginning, there has no end, and son means had a beginning. So how could it, it could be an eternal Godship, but never an eternal sonship? A son is one that's begotten of. So it had a beginning. So from the Logos, which was the Son of God, went out, created by these great fountains of purity. God, as those spirits went out. And it created uh, the Logos. And it was a body. It was in the form of what we are now which is called in the clergy a secret of theosophy. It's a body that doesn't have a uh, spirit in it. It's a body that's waiting for you Christians. As soon as the life leaves this, you go into that body. When this earthly tabernacle be dissolved, we have one already waiting. A theosophy. Now, when God was in theosophy, which was Christ in the making, then that theosophy becomes flesh and dwells as mamas. Then that was to redeem. He came from there down through this to redeem this creature, give it life, and take it back up into the eternal one. See? Now, 
There's only one eternal life. And that lays in God only. And God only has eternal life. And we have been privileged to become the sons of God. Then that word, he that heareth my words and believeth on him that sent me, hath eternal life. The Greek word zoe that are used for God's own life. The creature that accepts him becomes a part of God is just as eternal as God is. Right. There's no reason for us to doubt that. It's God's everlasting eternal word. And everything that had a beginning has an end. So what word did, word did sin begin? Sin began at the Garden of Eden and sin has an end. So if David cried, Oh Lord, my God, my soul is thirsty for thee in a dry land where no water is. Oh, thy love kindness is better to me than life. There must be two different types of life. And there is two types of life. And when a man is born in this world, he's nothing but a product of sin when he's born because he comes sexual desire. He's just a product of sin. The Bible says he is. He's born in sin, shaped in iniquity, come to the world speaking lies. And yet he's got life. But that life is a perverted life. That life was Satan cannot create life. He can only pervert what God has created. Satan has no way to create. There's only one creator, that's God. Satan couldn't heal, medicine couldn't heal. There's nothing else can heal but God because he's the only creator. And anybody that's intelligent would know enough to know that there is not a medicine or a drug or nothing in the world that can create life. God is the only solemn one and in creation alone. So he said, I am the Lord that heals all of thy diseases. Now we see the different types of life. That's the reason this man's born as a product of Adam, which was a product of sin, from listening to his wife, and the wife was a product of sins come from Satan, and Adam followed his wife out, a perfect type of Christ, going with his, the bride to take her sins, as Adam took the sins of Eve and left the Garden of Eden, not deceived, but willingly walked out with her, so was Christ not deceived, Satan could not deceive him, if thou be the Son of God. He knew who he was, but he deliberately walked out and took sin for the church. These are sin barriers. And now, everything that come out of that cycle of eternal life, when that goes back into its cycle again, into that ceaseless eternity, not one shape, form of sin in any way will ever enter. I hear one Baptist preacher believes in holiness. Notice, that's got to be cleansed, that person's got to be cleansed, and there's only one thing can cleanse him, that's the blood of Jesus Christ. Nothing else can do it. So I wonder then, when he cried, Oh God, my God, thy love kindness is better to me than life. There must be two different kinds of life then. And I begin to study it. How could it be two different kinds of life? Well, I begin to think that many people think when they're out here on the street running around and places that they're living the life. That is the thing. I've watched young mothers take their children and teach them tap dancing. Well, I wanted to have a little life. I've seen young ladies strip themselves down to just enough clothes that the law would let her put on and go out and she says, I'm really living the life. And the woman doesn't know that she's dead while she's alive. Some time ago in another city, I was going into my room and there was a Aquinas club or some certain club was having a meeting. In this city, it was having a rally, a convention. And when I went in, went up on the elevator, there was two young ladies coming down just with their underneath garment on, 
with the whiskey bottle in their hands, all whooping, going in man, dragging them from one room to the other, and I sat back in the shadows to watch. And when they got close to me, old, tall, vulgar, and they were both women, no doubt married women, with their husbands at home, maybe, thinking they were having a little clean fun. There is no such a thing. And then they was up there hooping it around, kind of relaxing, they was called. One of them stopped and said, whoop, these, this is life. I said, oh, no, that's not life. That's death. The Bible said, she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she is alive. The Bible said that. And this many times that the devil tries to tell you that that's life, but that's death. And notice also that that life becomes so miserable till people take that life. Take a gun and blow their brains out. There will be many of them in Chicago perhaps this summer. There will be many of them jump from the towers and drown themselves. There will be people in Chicago the next few weeks turn their gas chambers on, kill themselves. There will be some deliberately drive in front of automobiles and kill themselves. There will be some take poisons and suicide on every hand. That kind of life becomes so treacherous so we know that the prophet wasn't talking about that kind of life. That's death. That's death in a form of life. That's what Hollywood has done for the United States. It's perverted. It's stripped our women. It's, it's done all kinds of evil things. It's made our men. It's produced things here that's perverted the real stream of life into death. Even our nation is dying. I was speaking a few moments ago with my wife when we were sitting in a little place and there was them women coming in there each with a cigarette and some a little girl sitting there with her eyelashes pulled out and painted like the devil way back and hooked over sideways and she was standing up poor little thing not no older about 18 smoking a cigarette and drawing her way out making an awful thing to scoot the smoke from her nose not realizing she was dead in trespasses and sins you defile this temple, God will destroy it. What's the trouble is, we've got too many weak pulpits that's afraid to preach an eternal burning hell. And to warn the people of the things and let the church go just as sloppy and sloppy as it can be. And I said, honey, where could we start from? Our nation is corrupted. Our politics is as rotten as it can be. Our factories and our economics is just as rotten as it can be. Even the car industry takes you six or eight months to get the bugs combed out of your car. It's on line, symbol line, go it together. What difference does it make? Our womanhood is broke. Motherhood of America is Christ. The morals is as rotten as in any nation there is in the world. What's the matter? It's because they have loved the things of the world more than they've loved God, and they got to pervert it. Exactly right. Not only that, but our churches is crushed. Little old pulpit, sissy five preachers that stands up and I ain't criticizing no certain ones, but they stand up and it's a meal ticket. It's an offering. Or it's a proper name to get on television or on the air. I wouldn't sell my birthright to Jesus Christ for all the televisions and popularity there is in the world. Uh, life means more than these nasty, ungodly things. I'd rather have favor with Christ than to be the president of the world. What a condition the world got into. Here not long ago, I know to the church in our country, and many of them throughout the country, that they just 
careful, just carefree. And I'm not scolding people. But brother, I've got the answer at the day of judgment for the messages I give to the people. God's the only thing he can do, no, nothing can save this nation. It's gone. There cannot be no worldwide revival in this time. There's nothing to build on. Jesus locked his dick in me when it comes to a place that is vulgar and dirty, a place is Paris, France, which has been the seat of Satan for the hundreds of years. Women, vulgarity, nationalism. When they, we used to go over there 25 years ago and get their design to run on our women, we've got the low to they come over here and get our designs to put on their women. Right. right? Newspapers and magazines fix it up. And the poor people are waiting in it. There's only one thing the Holy Spirit is doing. That's salvaging what he can be elected of God to pull out. So for me, as long as I got breath in my body, I'll call out and condemn the thing. I can't stop it. God said it would be there. I can't stop it, but I'll give a voice against it. That when God plays over his tape recording at the day of judgment, they'll know that they was told the truth anyhow by the word of the living God, and God confirmed it with signs and wonders. They'll be up to them. Right. Listen, friends. God created a man to thirst. God put thirst in a man. A man was made to thirst. And do you mean to tell me that you would try to quit that blessed holy thirst with the world and with the devil's program? You'd try to quit that thirst with drinking whiskey that God put in you to thirst after him? There's something in man to thirst. God made that thirst for a man to thirst for him. But you try to quench it with pleasure. And this American people has quenched it with pleasure. Mad. That's right. That blessed holy thirst. You strip yourself on these beaches. You lay in these pool rooms. Playing cards. Social drinking. All this nonsense that you do and stay home on Wednesday night watching the television instead of going to church? What are you doing? You're trying to quench that holy thirst. You've got to quench it some way and you reject Christ and the devil pours his top into you. Quench! And you think that you're right but the Bible said there is a way that seems right unto a man. But the end thereof is the ways of death. Death is total annihilation, separation. You never try to quench that blessed church with something the devil will put into you. Now, not only you say, well, I'm not a drunkard, I'm not a gambler, I'm not a pleasure seeker, but brother, if the devil can't get you one way, he'll try another. And the devil has tried to quench with his type of life the thirst that God gave you for his life. He's let you join church. He's let you shout. He's let you speak with tongues. He's let you do all kinds of demonstrations. And still, you're drinking from the devil's slop can. That's the life. When a man thirsts after God, his whole being is surrendered to God. People go around the day and join churches and live like the devil. They think they quench that thirst. I go to church, that settles it. Many times I've told them, when they come on Easter, that's usually when everybody wants to show their new hat. They'll come on Easter, you might as well bid them a Merry Christmas, because you won't see them again on next Easter. And yet they are members of the church. They are members of that denomination, but a member of the church is born again of the Spirit of God, and the soul cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. That blessed holy thirst 
that God gives you to thirst after Him, then you pervert it. Give it something else. That hunger, that thing that you want to do, test out and see what it's thirsting for. See what it's after. This is what David said here. My soul thirsts after thee in a dry land where no water is. Oh, could you imagine being in a dry land where no water is? That's taking a, like taking a fish out of the water. It is killing pretty soon. And the real born again saint of God, not just once in the morning when he get up, but all through the day, that blessed thirst calls out for God. And you'll smoke a cigarette to quieten your nerves to the praying. And a member of the church, you don't take a little sociable drink and call yourself a Christian to quieten your nerves instead of letting God quieten you. Loving. You go out and throw your arms around some other man. Have a little clean fun. Have a little date on the side. A little afternoon kiss at the back gate to satisfy that thirst that God's putting you to thirst after him. And you will take another man's wife and run off with her and live in a hotel with her and carry her on like that. I don't say you do it. You may be here. If you are, God burn that in your soul. Right. Thinking you're having a little clean fun. There's an all-seen eye watching you. And the devil is trying to burn your passions after other women as you walk up and down the street half dressed and you long looking almost half wrecked at them little old dirty vulgar stinking women out there with them little old dirty clothes on and you man that let your wife do that that shows what you're made of that shows what kind of a man you are a man is the head of the family he's the head of the house but today the woman's head of the house, head of the factory, head of the church, and everything else. Because it's become a conglomerate of sin, and Satan took Eve, and he still uses her. And America is a woman's nation. Not long ago in Germany or Switzerland, some lady said to me, a Christian woman, she said, Brother Brown, I like to go over to America. I hear that the ladies are really, well, they have the big sway there. Not in Switzerland. No, sir. But we have no asset, but here's what follows. It causes prostitution. Right here in Chicago, according to your paper, you have 2,000 abortion cases every day. 2,000 abortion cases. 2,000 innocent babies die every day because of filth. Uh, can you have a revival under them kind of circumstances? How many prostitutes hit the street last night and men with other women and women with other men and little girls turn them all and up and down the streets of poverty end up on Skid Row down here. Now walk through the city last night in Chicago. Look what was going on. How can you expect the Holy Spirit to sweep a revival over something like that? It's got to have a place to anchor. And they go to the churches out here in the morning and hear the little petty five sermon about something, go back home and think they're Christians. And close the church up. Early if the pastor preaches more than 20 minutes on the roses or who will be the next uh, president or something like that, they're a fine and put a new one in. That bunch of top poppers to hell bound, vulgar, pleasure seeking. The Bible said to be heady, high minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, truth breakers, false accusers, and coffins, and despisers of those that are right. God give us old time Christianity, born again experiences. That thirst, that thirst is in you, but it's for a purpose. Woman was made woman for man. Man was not made for woman. Woman was made for man. But a woman was made for a man. Not M-A-N. M-A-N. Not man, many of them, but singular. It's right. But when they 
stern or moral, when they scandalize themselves and men the same thing, you're perverting the very cause that God made you a woman or a man. Then you call that life. It's death. Then you go to church and join church and put your name on the church and become a church member and live like the world. It's perverting the very thing that God intended you to be. That thirst that God put in you to be like Him and to love Him and thirst after Him. The pastors and the churches and yourself, you've robbed yourself from that wonderful, blessed thing that God ordained for you to use. That thirst. Thirsty. Thirsty. Oh, if the Pentecostal church would only satisfy thirst in God instead of trying to follow some evangelist or some emotion or some little ism or little sensation, how much better off it would be. If all the Holy Spirit and divine love instead of sensations and little gifts and things like that, how much better off you'd be. God don't want you to run after gifts. He wants you to thirst after Him. Notice, David said again, as being the psalmist, and he was a woodsman, he lived in the woods. He knew what it meant to be in the woods. He always wrote of the still waters and green pastures and the shady places. He knew what it was because a shepherd has to find those things. He has to know where those beautiful places are. Many times have I been into the desert. Riding out there to a place where I had to leave my horse. Poor thing was too much out of water. We couldn't have to either drink the horse or I. How we would thirst. Oh, if I could only find a track somewhere to get back. And then when you get to that state, the devil begins to show you mirages. You know what a mirage is? Did you ever go down the road and look and see the sun shining on the road look like a lot of water? Oh, it looks fool you. You don't want to go out and see where a bunch of geese coming from Canada, or ducks, and they see one of those on the road and fell in the road and they all burst it open. They thought it was the water. Oh, the devil's got a many a pitfall for the people. It looks like it. I've seen people thirsting, where they run to these places and fall into them, look, think it's in water. Looks just like a big running water. They're throwing up on their head, thinking it's water, and still in the hot, burning sand. And the devil told you, little lady, you sister, that if you do all these things, and you brother, if you do all these things, and have a little social letter on their mind and stuff, well, you don't want to listen to that old crack preacher. You don't want that Bible that was translated four or five times. There's nothing to it. You just join church and be a good citizen. That's nothing else in the world but a mirage the devil showed you. You're just keeping more sorrows all the time on you. But there is a fountain. Filled with blood. Run from him and you things. And sinners plunge beneath the flood. Lose all their desire for the world. For if you love the world, all the things of the world, the love of God's not even in you. It's satisfying portion of God. He has for each of you. It's for whosoever will. David, he wrote one time in the Psalms, he said, I'll be the 47th time. He said, as the heart thirsts for the water brook, so my soul thirsts after thee, O God. Oh, when I think of that David being a woodsman and out into that part of the country, you find out a lot of times there's a lot of deers that run. The heart is a deer. And if you watch nature, you'll see God. And they have wild dogs in that country. And they eat the deer. They come in packs, and they overtake the deer. And one of the things they do is cut the little, what we call hamstring in the back, the leader. And just cut out a whole pack. Then they can't run. The dogs will eat as much as they can. Then the others can't pull away very much. And then uh, it's easier for prey then to run right back and get them. That's the way the devil does. He'll cut you off in prayer meeting. He's done cut the hamstrings right then. You'll pull out from this church without and you'll run from here to there, but any time the devil wants to gobble you up, he's got you under his control. When he cuts your prayer life, brother, you're gone. That's right. 
when he cuts that first off of you and perverts it into the things of the world, he's got you where he wants you. He'll let you gobble around here till you get to a certain place and crash your life out without God right there. Sure he will. Now, the dogs, the hounds of hell, hound after the church. Certainly it does. But look, now really, a, one, from the wild dogs eat Jezebel. Did you ever know a dog won't eat human flesh? They won't even lick the blood of a human being. You can't get them near it. No, sir. But this was a certain kind of dog. It was a wild dog. Not a domestic dog, but a wild dog. Wild dogs are wolves. Just like a wolf. And they will eat human beings. But if you notice, this wild dog that come in to eat Jesse Bell, it was a certain type of dog. And that's the way it is today. The devil's got a bunch of old wild dogs out. They call them the wolf whistle and everything else to you young folks. But remember, it's the hell of hell! Right at you. That makes you think that you're a popper. The boys whistle at you because you're dressed the way you are. You poor little simple thing. You don't know what you're doing. That's right. You don't know that you're a prey of the devil. That's the devil! Listen to his voice. Oh, he might talk ever so well. He might even be a pastor of a church. Well, let me tell you, it takes a real sheep herder to tell the difference between a whine of a goat and a whine of a lamb. They both bait just the same. You can watch it if you're her. If you know your sheep, you can hear his call. But if you don't hear one of them, you can tell there's a goat or a lamb blatant. The devil can bait just like a lamb. That's exactly right. But David, he said, as the heart thirsts for the water of it, so my soul thirsts after thee, O God. And you see these little uh, deers out on the desert as they're jumping along, having a good time. And the first thing you know, a pack of wild dogs will run among them, and they'll grab them. Now one of the favorite places for a wolf or a wild dog to grab a deer is just behind the fur of the ear. There's a big archery runs up there and runs down along the neck. If the wolf can jump, Hang his fangs right in. The, 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 then when the wolf throws his weight down, he them two big blood things in front, cuts the deer's neck. And the little fellow staggers a couple times and he's done. Covered all the wolves and he's eat up just in a little. Another favorite place for the wild dog or wolf to catch the deer is in the flank. He'll grab him in the flank and when the wolf throws his weight, that's right in the mid-center like of the little deer, it throws him off his feet. And then down he goes. He's got him. And sometimes when the wild dog grabs the little deer and the little deer was quick enough to maneuver, he could jump fast to one side. The dog lost his hope because it jerked the whole chunk out of the little deer's side. Then the blood was free. If the wolf missed the blood vein here, cut just a little low, the little deer, maybe if he's quick and can maneuver, he can get away from the dog. Then here it comes at you, shot into this blood. And that little deer, any hunter here knows that if you wound a deer and he can get the water, you just might as well quit tracking him. He can live as long as he can find water. But when he can't find water, he's finished. And could you imagine as David standing there seeing that little deer and he's cut by the wounds of a wild dog and he's thirsting for the water brook. He must find the water or perish. If he doesn't get to that water brook, he's going to die. The hounds are right behind him. He's either got to find the water brook or perish. David said, as the heart thirsts for the water brook, so my soul thirsts after the old God. I have to have you or I'll die. I'll take the water up at the end of my road. If I can't find you, Lord, I'll die. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst for the water brook where they shall find it. Yes, there is a fountain filled with blood for every sinner. Good from Emmanuel's veins, you who thirst and long to be righteous, there is a fountain open today for you. The hounds of hell might have wounded you. They might have cut you this way or cut you that way. They might have thirsted and drunk your blood and sent you to these places and pleasure crazy. If you really want to get over it, there's a water brook open today. 
That's the love of the Lord Jesus Christ, His Spirit flowing free as the Holy Spirit. Whosoever will, let him come and drink from the fountains of the water of life freely. Whosoever will, just black, white, brown, yellow, whatever you may be, Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, Church of God, Church of Christ, Catholic, Pentecostal, whoever you are, young, old, middle-aged, there is a fountain open, and the waters of life is flowing freely, and the Holy Spirit says, Come all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Blessed are ye when you hunger and thirst, for I will fill you, you shall be filled. And the heart thirsts for the water, but my soul thirsts after thee, O God. In conclusion, I say this. The trouble with the Pentecostal Church, the Methodist, the Baptist, the Presbyterian, and all the rest, it is their congregation. If that congregation really thirsted for God, it would send that little old preacher out of there and give him somebody in there who preach him the gospel. Right. You can't go to town today, you merchants and you businessmen, you're in this convention. Are you shoe man? What if you put the old-fashioned button shoe that the woman used to wear? You got a shoe hook with it when you bought it. What if you try to sell that shoe in Chicago today? You think it'd have any business? No, sir. And it's got five times the letter that these little old still such a deal for women with a little peg like that and their toes sticking down, their heels sticking up. Charge them twenty-five and thirty-five dollars for about forty cents worth of letter. And you're silly enough to buy it. But why is it? Why don't the merchant, if he tells them the truth, they don't want it? Exactly right. The skirts that your mother used to wear, that covered her all over, and she probably paid three dollars a dollar and a half for it. And you go down to town and pay thirty-five dollars for a little vulgar thing that the devil poured you in to get out here and make the answer to adultery at the day of judgment. But that preacher, you say, I never really commit adultery. I don't know about that. The Bible says, Whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. And it don't matter how moral you live, how clean you live, how honorable you live, your husband, if you dress yourself to make a man look at you like that, at the judgment bar of the sinner that answers for adultery, you will be the one who committed it. Right. I'll take that with you, my dear friend. Think it over for a little while. Whosoever, said Jesus Christ, whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after her, hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. And before he could commit adultery, the woman had to present herself in that way. If she poured herself sexy looking out on the street, no matter how clean she is, Marley, she's adulterous. In God's book, there's your Hollywood, there's your devil. You might hate me for this, but brother, at the day of judgment, you'll see I've told you the truth. That's exactly right. Now clean up, straighten up. Teach others to do the same. Your soul goes thirsty. Oh, God, I don't care about your fences and your popularity. I want Christ or I'll die. When the Pentecostal church gets to that, God will move on the scene. And he'll never move on the scene until the people begin to thirst for him instead of the things of the world. Let us pray while we think over it. Are you guilty? While you're praying, everybody, a little prayer in your heart. Am I guilty of that? Examine your soul with God's book today. What kind of a life have I been catered to? Oh, Lord. Oh, my God. Thou art my God. Early in my youth, Will I seek thee? My soul thirsts for thee. My flesh, oh my. Don't want to be stripped off. They don't want to do this. They don't want to be filled with alcohol and stuff. My flesh longs for thee in a dry land where there is no water. To see thy power. What? I want to see thy power, Lord. Thy glory. 
Thy power to heal the sick to magnify. Thy glory to shed over the people like a great fountain of old-time religious meetings. To see thee as I have seen thee in thy sanctuary. Because thy loving kindness is better to me than life, little L. My lips shall praise thee. Are you thirsty? Do you really want to be a real Christian? If you really want to be an old-time Christian, there's something in there that makes you lonely. Do you want to go to heaven? You remember the animal doesn't want to go to heaven. The animal hasn't got no soul. The animal don't know what life you're after is. But you know what life you're after is. You long for life you're after. The animal can't. It has no soul. But you were made with a soul, and that soul was given you to make a decision. That heart that is in you, it makes a decision. And the animal can't make that decision because it has not that in it to make. But there's something in you that longs for God. And you're trying to quench it. Maybe by staying home, getting in an air-conditioned room, and looking at the television, and staying home from prayer meeting, and never reading the Bible, and going down to church on Sunday morning, and then maybe going back, paying the pastor, and waiting for an evangelist to come to the city, and you might sit back and say, well, that preacher's a pretty good fellow. I'm telling you, I kind of like him. I kind of like the way he smiles. I, I, I like the little jokes he pulls. Brother, that's not life, that's death. That's death. But do you really long for a room that you can go into? Set out under the old shade tree of the Bible. Look up with tear-stained eyes and say, Blessed Savior, Thou will guide me till I reach that helpful shore. Is there something in your heart that you long to love Him and to praise Him and to worship Him? All the things of the world become dead. You just Christ or die. I must have Christ or I must perish. Now I want every head bowed and every eye closed and everyone's raised. Be honest. Be sincere. If you really mean it, and you raise your hand to God and say, Lord God, from this day on, please, I know I, 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 these things that I do is not right, but I want to love you. I want what that preacher said today about you in the Bible. My thirst is after thee like the heart thirsting for the water brook. And the thirst, Lord, that I've had, someday I expect to be a great person. Oh, I do too. But after I've crossed the border yonder, I expect to be God's child. Do you really want to be that? If you do, would you just raise up your hand to me? Thank God it's me. I now raise my hand and say, my soul is thirsting for thee, God. God bless you, lady. God bless you, young lady. God bless you and you. Someone else, God bless you. God bless you and you, lady. God bless you, sir. You, lady, you might be church members. I don't have nothing to do with it. You can be a church member and just as black as a heart out here on the street. I know you say that's hard preaching, Brother Bam. If you come here at night time or come any other time and watch around the lights and see the things that the Lord Jesus does exactly in the Word, surely I should have some conception of what Christ means. I know this one thing, brother. The devil has perverted life. He has perverted the church action. He's perverted so much. He's perverted the people. And it's the hardest thing in the world to get the people to see the actual truth. It's right. Oh, they miss it by a thousand miles. Do you really long for him? If you do, would you raise your hand again? God bless you. Now, just keep praying. You that's longing for him, I'm wondering if you could walk down here just a minute and let me pray with you just a minute. Would you just get up out of your seat quietly? I'm going, I ain't going to call. I'm going to let the Holy Spirit call. You just get out of your seat. God bless you, sir. God bless you, lady. Just get out of your seat and come down here. Let me pray with you. Stand right along this side of the altar here, if you will. While the organ is playing, I'm not going to stay no more. I'm just going to wait a moment. Let the Holy Spirit call. Come right down here and stand. There's a fountain open. You want to be an old-time Christian, do you? Is your soul really thirsty after God? Would you rather dress decent, be just a little hot, as you call it? Anybody knows when you take your clothes off, you get hotter? 
certainly. Go to a desert somewhere where they really have heat. Certainly. You say, well, I'm like that side. That's good. People just coming up and coming down the aisle from this little group this afternoon. Many are gathering around the altar here. Come on up. If you're really thirsty, have you been bit by the devil? You really want to serve God. You want that thirst in you. You want it satisfied. If you do, come on to the sun. Or have you got to a place where you've been so seared and so hard and callous so nothing can touch you no more? Then you cross between this, between life and death. I remember it. If I be a servant of God, God will speak that I tell the truth. There's people that actually believe that they are right and they're wrong. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof is the ways of death. If you haven't been born again of the Spirit of God and your whole desire is to love every day, every hour, every minute of the day when you're awake and you're on the bed, you're praising Him, and your love is for Him in the things of the world, all this modern stuff is all dead to you. You better take your place at the altar. Now, we wait just a moment longer. Now, take the fountain, please, real slowly, while everybody's crossing up. There is a fountain all the way down.
How do you know this is not your last opportunity? And don't come unless you really mean it. But if there is the least bit of thirst in your heart, as a heart thirsts for the water brook, so my soul thirsts after the old God. Oh, Lord, I've got to have your die. You see what's gathering around the altar here this afternoon? Probably Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, Lutheran, Pentecostal, some no church at all. But there's a thirst there. They're longing. I'm going to wait just a moment longer. I've got just a few minutes longer. Just in one hour, I promise to be an hour. Just a little minute longer. I want to say something to you now. If you want to come on, come right ahead. You've been in these meetings. Now, get all the skeptic feeling away from you. I want you here at the altar right now not to depend on any emotion at all. No emotion. I want you to look at just exactly what God said. Now listen. I know the Lutheran said, the just shall live by faith. All right? There's a many of them started out, but they wasn't just. Methodist said, brother, when you shout, you got it. Many of them shouted and didn't have it. The Pentecost says, when you speak with tongues, you got it. Thousands speak with tongues and hasn't got it. Their life proves they haven't got it. Jesus said, by their fruits you shall know them. What is the fruits of what? The church? A real sweet feeling in your heart, knowing that you've passed from death and life, that you're at peace with God, real tender heart that feeds on the things of God, and have all the... Now remember, I believe in shouting, I believe in speaking with tongues, I believe in everything God said, I believe in every miracle, every sign, but I would rather have this than all the rest of it put together. Would you rather have it? I'd rather have that real, sweet, mellow, holy spirit moving into my life and making all the world pass away than I have all the noise as I believe in shouting. Sure, I shout and scream myself. <laughs> That's right. I believe in every gift that would be here preaching healing. I believe in all those things. But, brother, that isn't it yet. That's not it. These gifts and signs, that's not it. It's Christ in the heart. That's it. Then you'll stay. That's life. God bless you now. Cards will be you up. Six o'clock. And now, the Lord bless you. I'm going to turn the service to the pastor while I go to pray to make ready for the healing service tonight. God be with you until we meet.